too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone. How are you? My name is Marina Robinson Snowden, and I'm a fifth year PhD student in the MIT Nuclear Science and Engineering Department. Um, and I'm also the president of the MIT chapter of Global Zero. On behalf of RADIUS, the Iranian Studies Group, and the MIT Center for International Studies, we would like to welcome you to our panel discussion on the nuclear agreement between Iran and the P5 plus one. Before we jump into the panel event, um, I wanted to acknowledge that we suffered a loss recently in the MIT community, um, the MIT graduate community specifically, and we wanted to just acknowledge and send our condolences to the family and friends of Kara from the economics department. Um, moving back to the matters at hand, everyone knows that last Thursday marked the deadline for the US lawmakers to vote on a resolution of disapproval for the nuclear agreement. Um, this vote would have prevented the president from exercising provisions allowing him to waive sanctions on Iran. Senate, Democrat block, d Senate Democrats blocked this resolution vote three times, and we're now looking at the implementation of the agreement by the October 18th implementation deadline. At this moment, I'll pass it on to our moderator, Professor Scott Kemp from the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering here at MIT to take over. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, event where you will have the opportunity, I hope, uh, to ask every question you have about the Iran deal of our expert panelist here. It is indeed uh, a seminal uh, deal uh, for international security and for nonproliferation. Uh, and uh, we have a great panel uh, for you. Sorry, this is a very directional microphone. Great panel for you tonight. Let me just quickly introduce them. On your far right is Dr. Elizabeth Gronlin from the Univers Union of Concerned Scientists. Elizabeth and I met mm, 11 years ago in China. Uh, she's responsible for getting me and many other scientists into the field of international affairs. If you are a young scientist and are interested, <laughs> you should come talk to her uh, about what she does with the uh, international workshops on, what are, they, what are they called? Science and? Science and Global Affairs. Global Affairs, fantastic program. And I cannot promise that you will end up as a professor at MIT, <laughs> though. <laughs> I completely owe my career to her. <laughs> Lisbeth has been working on, on US uh, nuclear issues for a long time. Uh, recently, I, I know she's been working on the revitalization of the US weapons complex here in the US, but she has a long history of these issues, going back to to the 80s, working on issues like ballistic missile defense. She's also worked on space weapons. She's been at the Union of Concerned Scientists for 23 years. This organization founded here at MIT to address exactly these issues where science hits society and shapes policy. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. She will answer most of your technical questions, I think, tonight. Uh, moving on to the middle is uh, Dr. Apaya Mothenny. Moseni? Moseni. I apologize. Uh, he directs the Iran Project at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and he's a lecturer on uh, government and politics department. Prior to coming here, one of the many areas that he worked at was the US Institute of Peace, which is uh, basically a, a government-funded think tank. But this organization was extremely important. Uh, uh, influential in basically shaping the space for a negotiation with Iran because it helped bring to American policymakers an understanding of how Iranians think, what they're after, and sort of made clear the zone of possible agreement. So he's done very important work here. He's an expert on factional politics in Iran, and if you know Iran, this country has more factional politics than I think any other country in existence. Uh, indeed, our failure to understand this led uh, to some early uh, you know, duds in the negotiating complex, but we finally got around to really understanding Iran. So it is great to have someone with that expertise on the panel tonight. Finally, let me introduce uh, Dr. John Terman, who is executive director of the, and principal scientist of MIT's uh, Center for International Studies. This center has been a stronghold here at MIT for many years on nuclear weapons issues. He has written on missile defense, strategic weapons. He's been a prolific communicator of these issues to the public, writing in venues such as The Nation, Boston Globe, New York Times, Esquire, Washington Post, et cetera. John, when I think of your work, uh, you know, not only do I think of political expertise and technical expertise, but one of the things you focus on a lot is the impact of these decisions by policy elites 
on the everyday person, the public, and the engagement of civil society, which is an enormously important issue. Uh, if I may quote Bertrand Russell, he said, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And I fear our decision makers too often forget that, uh, those wise words. And these are very important issues on the Iran nuclear deal. The lifting of sanctions will promise freedom and prosperity for the Iranian public. And yet many in Israel also fear that this deal will begin to in encroach on their personal security and have concerns about their daily welfare. So John, thank you for joining us. And with that, let's just get to the agreement. 159 pages, the most comprehensive non-proliferation agreement ever made, 22 months under negotiation formally, but really back channel negotiations going back at least a year earlier. Uh, this has been a, a long time in the making, a lot of track two, a lot of hard work. Uh, the question is, is this a good deal? Do we, is this a deal that we're happy with? And so for the basics, let's start with Lisbeth, and maybe she can take it away. Okay. Uh, so yes, it is a good deal. Uh, we at Union Concerned Scientists are very happy with it, and I think many others are as well. Um, I'm going to start by telling you, giving you a little background about um, how we got in the situation where we needed a deal, and then what is in the deal. So. Um, not everyone here, I think, is a nuclear engineering uh, graduate student, so I'm going to do a little basics um, having to do with nuclear power and nuclear weapons, where, where, which is where the problem starts. Um, some of the technologies that uh, you can use for nuclear power, you can also use to make nuclear weapons. There are two routes to a bomb. One is the uh, uranium route. When you dig uranium out of the ground, it has mainly uh, the isotope uh, 238 at 90, more than 99%, which is not the one that you want for nuclear power or nuclear weapons. The one you want is uranium-235, and you need to increase its concentration using enrichment facilities, enrichment technology. And um, this is one of the things that Iran has, that the deal has restricted. You need enrichment technology to produce fuel for reactors of the sort the United States has and most other countries in the world have. Um, and you need to enrich it up to between 3 and 5% in this, in this uh, preferred isotope, the uranium-235. If you keep going, it becomes weapon usable. And if you go up to 90%, it is the ideal 90% or higher, the ideal concentration for nuclear weapons. So the problem is if you have this technology, this enrichment technology, you can enrich for nuclear fuel, but you can also continue and enrich for nuclear weapons. The other route is plutonium, which is not found in nature. You manufacture it in reactors by burning uranium. And then it is embedded in the, the used fuel, which is very radioactive. In order to get the plutonium out of, of the used fuel, you need to reprocess it, which is uh, a complicated process because the material, the other material in the spent fuel is so radioactive. So there are countries that reprocess their spent fuel so they can reuse it, the plutonium, in, uh, uh, as fuel in other reactors. But if you have that technology, you could also reprocess it and use the plutonium for weapons. So. Um, when the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty came into existence back in 1970, um, all the countries that signed up, with the exception of five, um, who said, we agree not to have nuclear weapons, they also signed up to uh, have monitoring on any of their nuclear power facilities so that the, um, the international community could be sure that they weren't abusing these facilities to make material for weapons. So that's the, the basics um, of uh, the, the background that, that uh, leads us to the Iran deal. Um, so Iran is a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, had inspectors, had certain uh, responsibilities for telling the International Atomic Energy Agency when it was going to acquire new facilities. So under the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there are no prohibited activities related to nuclear power and nuclear research. It allows you to have reprocessing facilities, it allows you to have 
um, uh, enrichment facilities. It allows you to have pretty much anything. It just monitors it. So um, technically, Iran sort of got out of uh, uh, compliance with its notification requirements. And back in 2006, the International Atomic Energy reported to the uh, UN uh, Board of Direct, uh, UN Security Council that Iran was not in compliance with its NPT obligations. Um, the UN Security Council said, okay, we want you to stop enriching. Iran said no, and then they, the UN imposed sanctions. And that is the situation that led up to this process that Scott was telling us, this you know, several year process of trying to negotiate a, an arrangement whereby Iran would, I mean, it, it has already agreed to not build nuclear weapons. It's a member of the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. But it decided to accept additional restrictions in order to get rid of these sanctions. And so the, the deal, as I said, under the NPT, there are no restrictions on your, um, on your ability to enrich uranium. Under the terms of the deal, Iran has agreed to limit the number of centrifuges that it uses. Uh, and it will put uh, about two thirds of the ones that it currently has, it will put them in storage. It will also um, limit, severely limit, the amount of low enriched uranium that it maintains. So when you enrich uranium, <clears throat> it's not a linear process. If you start from natural uranium, which is less than 1% uranium-235, and your goal is to get up to weapons grade, you, are, you can get there three times faster if you start with not natural uranium, but three 0.5% enriched uranium. So Iran has a large stockpile of this material currently, and it will have to ship it, it'll have to do something with it. Uh, it will not be able to maintain the stockpile, which would have given it sort of a head start if it was going to uh, try to take, uh, try to enrich up to a weapon grade. <clears throat> the other thing the, uh, the deal does um, is it well, it doesn't, Iran agrees to um, allow verification above and beyond that required by the NPT, above and beyond that required by the additional protocol. And so we have, um, so the bottom line is that through these restrictions on its enrichment, it will uh, increase the amount of time it would take for Iran to so-called break out of the treaty. So if Iran decided forget the NPT, I'm really going to pursue a weapons program. How long would it take from that moment on for Iran to take its facilities and zoom as fast as it could forward to get enough uranium to build a bomb? You may have heard the, um, the year, the year uh, uh, period tossed around. Uh, the administration says it would take Iran a year to build enough plutonium um, uranium to acquire um, one nuclear weapon. It says currently it would take Iran two to three months, and so the deal extends it up to a year. The year calculation assumes a variety of things. It assumes how efficient Iran's centrifuges are. It assumes how much Iran would need to build one bomb. And all of these things are, you can change those assumptions. Um, and in particular, the assumption about how much Iran would need to build uh, one bomb depends on how sophisticated its weapons design capabilities are. But what is true, even if it's not a year, if it's not two months and then a year, maybe it's only one month if you make a, a more, um, I don't know if it's optimistic or pessimistic assumption about Iran's capabilities. Um, and so, so it might not be a year, it might be six months. Um, but the, the deal, expands by a factor of four to six the amount of time it would take for Iran to, to build enough material to build a nuclear weapon. And then, as I said, that's sort of the, um, the overt route. The other thing it does addresses the covert route, the potential for Iran to um, secretly acquire enough material to make a nuclear weapon. <clears throat> and it does that by, re by enhancing the kinds of things that uh, Iran will allow inspections of. And it has a provision for, um, 
inspections, a challenge inspections at any site that the, um, the, member, the members of the agreement uh, believe Iran may be using to uh, work on a nuclear weapons um, program. So we can talk more about that in detail, I think, later. Uh, but those are the two basic things it does, is it, is it uh, lengthens the amount of time it would take for Iran to break out by, by going an open route, makes it more difficult for Iran to go the covert route because it'll be more difficult for it to hide its activities. And I wanna make clear that I'm not assuming that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. I think sometimes the language is, oh, this is going to stop Iran's nuclear weapons program. Um, well, it's not clear they have one. I mean, I think the US government believes they had one, but no longer has one. And so I, I think we need to be um, just very clear that this is n there should be no assumption that Iran currently has a nuclear weapons program and that this is a deal that stopped it. So I think I'll end there. Perfect. So let's move now to Payam is gonna talk about domestic implications in Iran. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, MIT Global Zero and other um, associations and organizations at MIT for sponsoring, including the Iranian study group here. Um, so as Scott just said, I'm gonna be focusing on um, the Iranian position and um, Iranian politics in particular, looking at three things. Um, so why the deal now for Iran? You know, what really brought Iran to the table? Um, what will the implications be for Iranian politics moving on into the future? And what will this um, herald for U.S.-Iran engagement or future prospects of a U.S.-Iran um, direct bilateral relationship? So on the first question, why now for Iran, um, I'd say there are largely three factors explaining what changed for Iran to come to the negotiating table now and reach the current negotiated um, agreement. The first is, as most of you must have um, heard in the media, sanctions. But sanctions really gets thrown around um, in different ways, and even detractors of the agreement would say, no, if we only had increased sanctions even more, um, we would have gotten a better deal. But this type of argument really rests on not understanding the precise mechanisms and ways that sanctions have impacted um, Iranian politics and the Iranian scene. Um, the, the narrative is that kind of sanctions have crippled the Iranian economy, it's brought the regime to its knees, so it was forced to come to the table and reach a settlement to lift sanctions, and the regime needed this for its survival. Whereas I argue that the way that sanctions have mattered is not by crippling the economy, but actually fragmenting the conservative coalition under the Ahmadinejad government. So sanctions basically blocked um, more conservative um, traders and merchants and capitalists who, were, who wanted to trade internationally and were connected to the global economy. So it created a fissure and a wedge that drived um, uh, a separation between what we today call the hardliners, who would be opposed to the whole agreement, supposedly, and that's not necessarily the case, um, and other conservatives who then um, are supportive of the agreement because they do want sanctions lifted. So yes, sanctions were important, they had an impact, but they had an impact by changing the interests and coalitions in power in the Iranian regime. And on top of that, this changing um, configuration of elites, the way that it rebalanced and realigned because of sanctions, it impacted the elections in 2013 that brought moderate President Rouhani to power. So Rouhani's coming to power was just as significant, if more, not more than sanctions, because it's the moderate stance and position of the Rouhani government that allowed for the agreement and these negotiations to really move forward and move forward effectively and for the Iranian state to accept by um, the stipulations that are within this agreement. Now, the Rouhani government, uh, as we'll see, this will matter for the next question on impact of the deal, the Rouhani government is basically, up to now, a coalition of conservatives, moderates, and reformists who are united by um, the objective of wanting to lift sanctions, okay? So the third reason now why Iran came to the negotiating table, why the negotiations succeed, really doesn't have to do with Iran. It has to do with the United States. The United States changed one of its positions, one of its red lines that it always had um, on the table on the nuclear negotiations, and that is that we will not negotiate with the Iranians until they fully stop um, their, their enrichment. So that actually changed um, limited um, 
Iranian enrichment was allowed to proceed during the times of the negotiation. And this was a switch of U.S. position um, throughout the, the years that um, there have been attempted talks by <clears throat> the, the parties in, in question. So the impact of the deal domestically. We can look at it in two different levels, one at the popular level, society, and one at the polit political elite level, the, the officials and power holders in the Islamic Republic. So at the societal level, um, there is a huge popularity for the current agreement. Um, the people are very happy, they're very optimistic. Um, President Rouhani's approval ratings have gone very high, the same with Foreign Minister Zarif. So generally, it's been a jubilant um, atmosphere inside Iran. Um, that is not to say, however, that everyone, even among the populace, is, um, approval, is approving of the deal. Um, there are detractors and critics who have actually um, become even more um, critical of the agreement um, because of their larger suspicions um, of, of Rouhani and the moderate camp leading the negotiations. Not so much as the negotiations, but who is leading the negotiations. Uh, but this, this jubilation and um, excitement is also, um, can, be vul can have vulnerabilities itself because um, they may create unmanaged expectations for the Rouhani administration. Mm -hmm. And this can come from two areas. The first is, um, and both have to do with er the public's misperceptions of the deal. The first area of public misperception of the deal has to do with economic benefits of the deal. So most, Iranian, uh, most Iranians incorrectly think that as soon as this agreement mm. was signed, sanctions are going to be immediately listed, lifted and you're going, to have, you're going to see the net economic benefits instantly. Right? And the administration has, nothing, has done nothing to mitigate that. Even up to today, listening to many speeches domestically, you'll hear that soon you'll see the economic mm. results. If not now, maybe in six months, one year the most. But really, by the time this, this, this process of implementation and verification of um, the Iranian nuclear record you know, goes through and sanctions are lifted, it will take a while before um, companies can really um, reinvest in Iran for SWIFT to be, the sanctions to be lifted. Um, then there are areas of some sanctions will not be lifted. It's only the nuclear related, particularly from the US position, the US nuclear sanctions are going to be lifted. So there are misperceptions of what this deal means economically. And the second area of misperception is that uh, based on the way that the, the government has sold this deal, most Iranians have misperceptions about the content of the deal. They believe that there's not going to be any type of verification or monitoring at any military installation. They believe that research and development really has not been curtailed or limited. Um, so they're not really that well aware of the restrictions and limitations that Iran has been um, accepting of. Um, but I think that's to a lesser degree significant. It's mostly the economic benefits. If the economic benefits do come in and the people are satisfied, they may look over some of those. Once those misperceptions come out that they were wrong, it may, really, it may not matter. But if economic benefits aren't really coming to the, if the people aren't feeling those economic benefits, um, and it doesn't match their expectation, then the other one, the latter area, can be a problem in and of itself. You know, so what was this deal really about? Oh, we gave this up and we got nothing in return. So that can be something that, um, as I'll say, the hardliners are kind of trying to bet on or wanting to um, see in the future. Now, at the political elite level, um, this is, of course, going to be uh, a boon for Rouhani and the moderates. Um, and it's very significant because you have parliamentary elections coming up next year, early next year in February. Um, and it's very likely that um, Rouhani will get, um, I won't say maybe a direct win, but he'll get a, uh, uh, it'll be a successful election for Rouhani and the moderate camps. Usually what happens is that there'll be a coalition <coughs> of factions um, who come to power in the parliament. And it's likely, I believe, that Rouhani will um, ally with a segment of the conservatives um, to take control or retain control of parliament, um, however one wishes to see it. But the, the problem comes um, based on my discussion of the sanctions. So the sanctions was um, a, un a uniting force. It united a broad coalition of conservatives, moderates, and reformists. So as soon as the sanctions are lifted, 
you'll see the, the competition that had always existed between these camps really come to the fore and the tensions will come back up. So there's gonna be a pull um, to, for, for Rouhani to move towards the conservative hardliner camp and there's gonna be a pull for Rouhani to move towards the reformist uh, and more moderate camp. So how Rouhani is able to really um, manage the scene will be important um, in addition to um, the eventual benefits that accrue from the lifting of sanctions. So the more benefits, the more Rouhani's hand will be strengthened. And finally, in terms of U.S.-Iran engagement, um, it'll be a very sensitive um, issue moving forward. Um, the Iranian regime has been very straight, clear, um, particularly the su supreme leader, very explicit in saying this is only an agreement over the nuclear issue. This has nothing to do with any other issue. Um, and even recently, he said we're not willing to discuss any other issue with the U.S., um, which actually runs counter to his own speech um, early on in the year, which he said, um, if the nuclear agreement moves forward, this may open the door to discuss other issues, particularly other regional issues um, that matter for U.S. and Iran. Um, but what's clear is that, um, at a minimum, um, the supreme leader um, and hardliners in the Islamic Republic want to prevent um, this deal from kind of um, going out of their hands and, and quickly leading to um, a, a quick rapprochement or normalization of ties, which they don't want. So it will most likely be a managed opening, uh, a cautionary opening uh, with the U.S., um, and we'll have to see what happens. Thank okay. you. John. Okay, well thank you for coming out tonight and uh, thank you to the organizers for putting this together. I'm gonna speak about the costs and opportunities of the deal uh, mainly for uh, the region, uh, North Africa, Middle East, um, because one of the optimistic assertions that's been made from time to time, one that I share, is that the, this deal could, could be a source of stability in a region that sorely needs stability. And it's a source of stability, uh, first of all, because U.S. and Iran, the U.S. and Iran are speaking to each other in a way that they have never spoken to each other since the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So, just this, this process of the nuclear negotiations has already, uh, according to many reports, spilled over into some side conversations uh, between Kerry and Zarif particularly, who have now uh, built a relationship that could be quite constructive. Uh, the, uh, the isolation and s sanctions that, uh, were imposed on Iran for these many years also tended to have favorable consequences for the worst elements in Iran, uh, the most destabilizing elements, the Revolutionary Guard and others who uh, control a lot of the economy, control a lot of the, uh, uh, the black market and, and uh, other sort of illegal or, or shady gray area activities. And so by normalizing, not technically normalizing in the diplomatic sense, but sort of bringing these, bringing Iran into the uh, international community in a way that it hasn't been for so many years, uh, it may uh, improve the chances that those, those forces do not have quite as much power as they had before. And the sort of the flip side of that, if moderates gain in Iran's political culture, its adventurism may diminish uh, in the region. It remains to be seen, and it's a, it's a topic of some controversy maybe we can address later. But those are all the elements of potential stability that come out of the Iran uh, P5 plus 1 agreement. Um, and I think they're quite real and, and hopeful. The first test of this, I think, is going to come with respect to Syria. Uh, it's already on the table, it's already being discussed 
uh, in these sort of side conversations that Kerry and Zarif have had and undoubtedly others, and now, of course, with the Russians as well. Um, there are two objectives, really, in this. One is to deal with the, with the problem of Assad and his future and his, him as a source of uh, the, the, the terrible consequences of the civil war. Uh, Iran, as you know, and Russia are both backers of Assad and um, Kerry will and has been trying to find a way to get them to agree to some sort of uh, removal of Assad from power while preserving the remnants of the state. Um, the other element of this, of course this has been thrown into some flux recently with Russia's deployment of, of military assets there, but um, uh, this, is a, this, this is a landscape that is changing every day, so we just have to keep our eye on it and hope that um, uh, the U.S. acts um, in a in a foresightful way. The other is, of course, the war against ISIS, and I'll return to this uh, as a key element of uh, a problematic element in the, in the new landscape there. But undoubtedly, this is v extremely important to Iranians. Uh, it's important to us. Um, it's obviously going to be of some consequence for the Russians um, and other big powers that want to play in the region. Turkey in particular, uh, but for the Iranians, it really is an existential issue. Um, if ISIS continues to grow and in power, it's, it's a sworn enemy of Shiism, and, and uh, it really does create uh, some horrible specters for uh, not just the, the Islamic Republic, but for the Iranian people as a whole. The progress on Iran's nuclear program, however, was really uh, made possible by a, an emphasis, a diplomatic emphasis, a diplomatic a set of skills in arms control. It's not a set of skills or perspectives or missions that have to do with Middle East politics per se. That is that, you know, the involvement of people like our own Ernie Moniz and, and others who really understand the technicalities that Elizabeth was just talking about um, and really have a great deal of experience as, a, as an institution, the U.S. government has, is, has this tremendous experience in arms control negotiations and how to do it. Uh, and they showed that. Uh, they showed that they had that and could coordinate the, um, the P5 plus one coalition as well. Doing the same thing in Middle East politics is another set of skills. It's not the same thing. And I think, unfortunately, the Obama administration has demonstrated over time that it doesn't really do very well in Middle East policy. I'm a big supporter of Barack Obama. I think he's an extraordinary person. But on the Middle East, policy of the Obama administration has not been very encouraging. There's a lot of failure there. And I'm afraid that there are going to be costs to the Iran deal in the region that are very troubling. And let me just outline two or three before we get to discussion. The first is that the, and I think the most consequential, is that the United States seems to have developed some relationships, some quid pro quos with uh, the Gulf monarchies in particular, but also with Israel uh, and possibly other states in the region to support or at least not oppose the nuclear deal. And in return for that, we're going to get some kind of U.S. support for something that we might not have otherwise supported. And the most obvious example of that is the Saudi assault on Yemen, which has become a humanitarian disaster and a disgrace. And I mean a disgrace that the United States is supporting this. There are over 5,000 people who have died in the bombardment over the last several months. Many of them are civilians, most of them are civilians, many of them are children. And the 
um, the source of this conflict is uh, Saudi uh, uh, sort of opposition to political changes inside Yemen that they believe are unfavorable to them. It's a complicated story. I'm not actually the best person to lay it out for you, but we can go into it later if you'd like. Um, but the United States has supported this with intelligence, with drones, with munitions, with advisors, 50 advisors doing targeting uh, in Yemen and uh, other assets uh, that I, th you know, under normal circumstances or under circumstances in which we didn't need Saudi support for something like the nuclear deal, we may not have participated in. Uh, this is not just a Saudi operation, it's actually almost all the Gulf monarchies and some other Arab states. And it's a proxy war because the, the, uh, the objects of the bombardment are the uh, is a Houthi tribe, so-called Houthis, that are um, supposedly aligned with Iran, although these uh, alignments seem to be very loose. It's not like Iran's support of Hezbollah. This is a much, much less uh, significant, much less uh, uh, tightly uh, woven kind of relationship. And, uh, and yet the Saudis are pursuing this, and I believe the other Gulf monarchies are pursuing this as a proxy war against Iran, and we're supporting that. There's a roughly similar situation with Israel in the sense that, of course, Israel, uh, the government of Israel, of Netanyahu, uh, strenuously opposed the Iran deal and will continue to do so, I believe. Uh, but um, they have, in sort of an ironic twist of how these things sometimes work, uh, are going to get a big boost in U.S. military equipment and support uh, as a way of sort of, uh, I'm not exactly sure why, they uh, sort of give them more security than they need. They're already a very secure nation with a very good army and air force and nuclear weapons and so on. But nevertheless, they're going to get more. And I worry about the consequences of that in that, uh, like Yemen, this, the uh, Israelis have, of course, uh, assaulted Gaza just over a year ago in a very similar kind of operation. Um, the results of that, over, well over 2,000 people dead in Gaza, um, and uh, Gaza not being rebuilt in the United States, really not making much of a fuss about that. And I'm concerned that there will be more of that kind of behavior in the future, and part of it is to try to draw Israel back toward um, the kind of relationship we've had with Israel in the past. Um, finally, uh, and there's also a kind of a similar situation with Egypt in which uh, we wanted to not have a situation where uh, another uh, challenge to the old order was going to be in the hands of a uh, of political is a party of political Islam in this case the Muslim Brotherhood and we have supported the coup and the strongman uh, General Sisi uh, as a consequence of that and they've also been um, supportive in return yeah so and finally I, I think the the situation in Syria brings up uh, another set of issues, which is, um, particularly with respect to ISIS, and that is a problem, a very broad problem in the region of, of radicalization of young men in particular taking up uh, arms against um, regimes, uh, other groups, um, proxies, the U.S. Army, etc., uh, in favor of a very, very radical vision of Islam. Jihadism is usually how it's described, and and uh, there's a good deal of concern about how widespread this is, and indeed the ISIS phenomenon, above all, represents the the most noxious form of this, and and it seems to be growing. 
And the, this relates to the Iran deal in the following way. One of the, one of the causes of radicalization is indeed the presence of the United States or the invasion of the United States of Iraq and, and the long history of Western imperialism, if you like, but other kinds of words could apply as well, but certainly involvement, often unwanted involvement in the region. And this radicalizes many people at the bottom of the, of the economic and social order uh, who see their leaders as being corrupt and uh, tied to the United States in, in uh, unfavorable ways. The Iran deal draws us deeper into the region. We have to be there. We have to be there to implement it. We have to be there to, um, to one hopes, uh, uh, get the benefits of the Iran deal, which gets us deeper into the region rather than uh, allows us to detach from the region and let Arab politics in particular uh, work out uh, their problems themselves. So, I th so I, unfortunately, I think that we're, we're getting deeper into these conflicts, deeper into the uh, instability, uh, the sources of instability, and that um, the Iran deal may not be uh, uh, enough of a counterweight to stabilize the region in the near future. And that is my grim prediction. Thank you, Thank John. You. Thank you, John. So, uh, you have three uh, wonderful areas of investigation here, how the deal affects Iran's ability to make nuclear weapons, uh, how the deal affects the U Iran and the U.S. relationship, which has been sour for 36 years, and is the question is, will it turn around? And also, what does this mean for now the Middle East, which is a, a you know, uh, a mixing pot of uh, instability, and will this uh, lead to problems or, or opportunities for engagement? This is your panel. I hope you will uh, have lots of questions for these experts. Let me just get us started with one question. Uh, we've heard that uh, the, so this is for all of you, but I think, uh, the, you know, I particularly want to hear Lisbeth on this, but I think all of, all of you will have views. We've heard that the deal will uh, push Iran back from uh, the brink of nuclear weapons if they wanted to acquire them. But what does this mean for the future of nonproliferation in general and for future agreements for other countries as they look to their ability to acquire uh, perhaps a nuclear weapons capability? Uh, you know, what, how should we see this deal impacting uh, this general objective of, of the international community? That's a big one. Um, well, I mean, it, the, the deal did not fundamentally change the, um, the situation with the NPT, which is that countries are allowed to have uh, fuel cycle facilities that would allow them to build nuclear weapons materials. So, I mean, it, it restricts some of those things, but I don't think it fundamentally changes that equation. And, and that is, um, I mean, that's a, that's a problem. There's some real... Um, there's some that you know there's an inherent problem there when countries have either enrichment facilities or reprocessing facilities. Now Iran um, did also commit to not reprocessing. It's uh, during the, the the next 15 years. I mean it has no reprocessing facilities, so that's an easy commitment. But they also said that they. Um, uh, did not intend to establish a reprocessing capability. But clearly on the enrichment side, they are fully intending to have a very robust enrichment capability. And I, I think um, the only thing that, th there have been people talking about trying to um, take the restrictions that are in this deal and make them more generally applicable to other countries. Um, I don't know if Marvin Miller is in the room, but he pointed out to me uh, a very interesting um, feature of the deal. There is a, uh, a clause that says, you know, these, nothing shall be taken here to construe that this uh, you know, that these uh, arrangements would uh, apply to other countries in the future for other kinds of arrangements. So I, I, think, I, I think it is uh, naive to assume that we could take what has been hammered out here for the situation of Iran 
and hope that it will apply to other countries in the future. So I guess I'm not Perfect. No, thank you. <laughs> optimistic on that front. Do we have questions from the audience? All right. Perfect. Um, on the topic of um, the deal from the side of the Iranian politics and the economic growth, if the economic growth is not substantial or um, if it is not tremendous, do you think the deal would be stable in that um, Iran, uh, from my simple understanding, um, Iran would have uh, faces like his enemies with Israel and Israel has nuclear weapons, so if it feels threatened, that may be its first objective to secure itself by developing nuclear weapons rather than trust in this deal. And you want to repeat the question so people can hear? Sure, yeah. The question was, so what happens if there's no economic growth? People's expectations aren't fulfilled. Will this jeopardize the agreement? And will Iran want to violate the agreement? Or will Iran want to rush to get a bomb to um, counteract an Israeli threat? Um, and I would say that, um, so let's say if economic expectations aren't fulfilled, there's really no economic um, gain from this negotiation, it's not going to, it's most likely not going to affect the deal. The deal will go through. But what it's going to affect, it's going to be a game changer domestically in terms of that'll be a selling point for the hardliners to weaken Rouhani and make sure he doesn't win re-election or to take back parliament if he's able to gain parliament now. So it's mostly going to be a change in Iranian domestic politics um, rather than a violation of the agreement per se. But the second thing that I think that'll impact, and it kind of goes back to your first question to Elizabeth, is that what happens to the agreement after 10 to 15 years? Um, and I think one of the main strategies the US should pursue and the administration is probably pursuing is um, engaging in Iran and integrating into the international economy in order to make sure that the moderates have a stronger position and to show Iranians that these are the benefits of um, working and cooperating with the international community. If there are no direct, um, there's no evidence or people don't feel, um, feel um, the benefits of undertaking such an arrangement, then of course that'll lead to questions of, you know, how much would Iran want, would want to expand um, its enrichment program or its nuclear program after 10 to 15 years. Um, if a more moderate, more economically integrated Iran, 10 to 15 years, um, may not be that interested in a nuclear program. It may see other benefits um, um, that it would, would pursue instead, whereas an Iran that really hasn't seen the benefits of the nuclear deal, an Iran where the moderates have lost because of um, the failure of the deal, then that'll be a different Iran um, with a different intention for its nuclear program. So, Marina, how long do, uh, do we have for the panel? Um, we have the room until 7. Okay, so you guys perfect. Can go out. All right, great. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> All right, I see the Arag. I have a question about Iran's internal you know, politics. And, uh, I'm most curious about what, are, what their maybe, you know, are the main motivators behind you know, Iran's decision to negotiate with Israel and and when I say Iran, I don't mean a monolith of Iran, but different, let's say, factions in Iran, whether there are interests or to pursue that, or some other factions are against pursuing that. And what has changed in the last 10 years? So is that me? That's you. Um, <laughs> so I would say, I mean, just so I go to Iran frequently, and I, I speak with a range of officials from moderates to hardliners, so across the spectrum. <laughs> Generally, I rarely see any perspective or voice um, in support of nuclear weapons. Um, it's quite adamant, it's quite unanimous that we don't want what nuclear weapons, that um, there's no benefit to nuclear weapons. If it's about the preservation of the Islamic Republic, well, look, the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. What is it doing? Is it a, if it's about Israel, well, look what Hezbollah without nuclear weapons is able to do with Israel. So really there's no, um, you don't hear directly any pro-nuclear weapon stance. Um, in addition to that, the fatwa issued by the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, really has put a lid on the discourse from a popular level um, because nationalists or Islamists really don't call for nuclear weapons as a right of Iranians. 
When did he issue that? Do you know? Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about the year, but it was uh -huh. several years ago yeah, right. in the okay. in the two thousands. Um, but um, there there are a bit of contestation about how it was issued, whether it uh -huh. should be in writing or not. Uh, but he said it several times in speech that the production, the stockpiling. Mm -hmm all this of the nuclear weapons is forbidden. But what it's done is basically, like if you go even speak with hardline Islamists, is that they will never say we, nuclear weapons is a natural right of Iranians. Um, whereas you ha may have seen that in countries like India or Pakistan, where there was popular support for nuclear weapons, you don't find popular support for nuclear weapons in Iran. You do find, it's very popular, people do support the Iranian nuclear program. But that's not nuclear weapons. Uh, in terms of if we do or if you do hear arguments for nuclear weapons in Iran, um, it's really not about Israel either. It's, it's about, look, we live in a, a dangerous region. Pakistan has it, China has it, Russia has it. All the great powers and civilizations have it. Why not Iran, Persia? So it's kind of like that. Um, and it's, it's seen more as a, a sign of power and recognition internationally. This question is for Professor Tema. Uh, I have exactly the same kind of uh, attitude toward uh, President Obama. I admire him for his intelligence, his wisdom, but I'm quite puzzled about his foreign policy in the Middle East, especially with regard to uh, development of democracy among the Arab Muslim countries. I don't know which kind of game he's playing. Is he in danger of some uh, blackmail from somewhere? <laughs> I think that uh, there, there are two ways of looking at it, or two segments of it. One is that it, with respect to Iran, they were very focused from the beginning on, po on a policy that would lead, I think, to the result that they've gotten. And that's not to say it was flawless because, of course, there was the 2009 elec election, which I think threw uh, everybody into a little bit of a tizzy. But it was, uh, a, a, there's a quality of discipline in the approach to Iran, which I think is very admirable, even though the rhetoric sometimes was over the top. Um, with respect to the Arab countries and, and, and the so-called Arab Spring, I think that they were caught flat-footed and unable to decide whether or not these uprisings were genuine kind of democratic small d uh, uprisings we should support or that it was going to lead to, to uh, something less favorable. And uh, there was a lot of hesitancy and fitfulness in, their, uh, in Obama's uh, approach to these things. Um, it took, you know, a lot of people by surprise, just about everyone, really. And in terms of the, 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 of Libya, of Egypt, and of Syria, of course, the decisions they made were bad decisions. But uh, uh, we can say that in retrospect more easily than we could say it in prospect at the time. That is, that it wasn't clear what the United States should do, in my opinion. Um, in those cases. Clearly, I think with respect to Syria, two things I would say, just to finish up. One is that uh, as with Iraq and Afghanistan, decisions made under Bush, uh, once you start a war, you don't know what's going to happen. This is, this is a, a law of mm -hmm. the universe that the politicians constantly forget. Once you start a war, you simply can't predict what's going to happen. And that, uh, I think, applies particularly to Libya in this case. Um, with respect to Syria, uh, Obama has been very determined to stay out of Syria. One of his key advisors on, on the Middle East um, came to speak here and we had a long conversation with him. Um, he said he just did not want to get involved in Syria. And I think mainly because of the experience with Iraq and then Libya. But 
it led him to some awkward policy that has turned out not to be very productive, including saying that Assad must go, uh, which has turned out to be uh, provocative and, and unproductive. So, um, you know, I, I sort of, he doesn't have a feel for it, and I don't think his advisors have served him well, frankly. Um, for example, the conflict in Yemen, where you, you characterize it as a proxy war against Iran, uh, in which Saudi and uh, other Gulf countries and Egypt are backed by the U.S. to fight those refugees that were you know, sort of ethically backed by Iran. However, in ISIS, you know, it's a huge problem where um, the U.S. is fighting the same enemy as the enemy of Iran, which is ISIS. What do you think could be some strategies for the U.S. for the policy to sort of reconcile some of those conflicting uh, goals? With respect to ISIS, particularly? Yeah, yeah. I wish I knew, um, and I don't. I'm not going to pretend to know, but I do think that there is um, the United States has to have a very light presence militarily in the region because it just keeps backfiring. So, you know, the, the fighting, if it's going to be fighting that's going to defeat ISIS, needs to be done by the Kurds and by Iran and by other Arab states, um, Iraq in particular. Um, the fact that they haven't been able to do this yet effectively uh, as a collective effort is discouraging but not uh, completely unfeasible for for the future. Um, we also have to think about, you know, non-military means of dealing with this. Um, I'm not sure what those are. A lot of people have made various kinds of proposals, none of which seem to be all that promising to me. But nevertheless, I think things need to think about how to how to either isolate them, how to you know, sort of starve them of resources or even open some kind of diplomatic channel to them. Um, it's 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 going to be a long slog, but I don't think that lots and lots of drone strikes and, and F-16 fight strikes are going to, are going to work. And um, at the same time, uh, it creates this radical, you know, it helps feed the radicalization narrative of the region. So, um, I would say more alliances with local partners and thinking, trying to think creatively about non-military approaches. And one question for Dr. Nelson, to some extent for Dr. Chairman. So we heard about you know, how this deal may affect the uh, Iran internal Iranian politics or dynamics. So I'm just curious to know your opinion about how would you think the deal would uh, possibly change or basically affect Iran's foreign policy in the area and uh, the way Iran thinks about its neighbor in the region uh, and also the opportunity to think on that briefly. So it really depends um, in terms of who's able to influence foreign policy in Iran or not. Um, officially, Iranian foreign policy um, will be made at the highest level at the National Security Council in Iran, which is made of a, um, a broad array of factions. You, you have members of, you have military officials, security officials, then you have um, President Rouhani um, and um, Ali Shamkhani heading it, who's a moderate. Um, so like other issues, there is a potential for dialogue and change in Iran's foreign policy. As Dr. Chairman said, Syria may be um, an area where we, we may be able to see it or um, we'll look for it. But the hardliners are also adamant very much so that foreign policy, particular, particular areas of foreign policy, um, Hezbollah, Lebanon, Israel, so like some of those more revolutionary axes, they will change no matter what. Um, so there may be areas um, or files that the moderates will be able to influence and others where it's really off. Um, it's, um, the moderates are not able to impact. But I think it will also be based on, you know, 
seeing how how events move forward and how will, that will impact and influence other issue areas. I just add one little thing to that, and that is that the um, Iran really cares about what the United States thinks and is doing. I mean, there's a tremendous imbalance in the relationship, uh, which will continue for a long time. That is that the United States is much more important to Iran than Iran is to the United States. And I think we forget that, actually, uh, in our approach to Iran. That is that what someone like, you know, Hillary Clinton gave a speech at the Brookings Institution the other day that was very kind of belligerent toward Iran, even though she supports the Iran deal. And I think that the more of that that comes from the American political establishment, mm -hmm. potentially the next president, uh, the more that the hardliners get fuel for their own fires. I mean, and um, my sense is Zarif certainly, maybe Rouhani also, and others in that camp really want to normalize relationships in the region. And that 36 years of isolation, 36 years of you know hostilities have not done them any good. And they want to go on another path. And the other path is the normalcy, really. Normal diplomatic relations, economic relations, and so on. So it's important what the United States says. It's not just for domestic purposes and getting elected. You really have to think about the effect that has inside Iran. Etienne. Um, last week, it's interesting policy was a big part of the debate and including the Iran deal and a bunch of them were just vacantly saying they would walk away and void the deal on day one basically. Let's just feel what if and is that realistic and what would be the consequences of such action and would be such like immediate decision of cancelling any commitment on the United States. And I had such high hopes for a technical question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Prospects for canceling the deal uh, by the Republican Party? I, well, I mean, I guess they could try to reimpose some sanctions, but they, I mean, the, the deal is not just the U.S. and Iran. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, all the other countries involved, and uh, those sanctions will be lifted. So, I mean, there's nothing really substantial that a Republican, you know, the next Republican president can do except probably really annoy Iran and give them, a, I mean, they would then have the, the right, since the deal would not be fully implemented, to presumably not, you know, implement the deal either, which would be a disaster. Um, but I, but it, realistically, I don't even think the Republican president would do that. Yeah. That's what they're I'd saying. I'd have to just add to that. I, I totally agree. I doubt that would happen by yeah. the United States any administration that would come to power. But if it were to happen, that would be a huge win for Iran. It would be a clear win. Marina. Um, I have a question for Elizabeth. Um, is there any particular part of the agreement that you find technically weak that you would like to have seen strengthen? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I would have. So there are restrictions on, um, on the enrichment capabilities that go on for, in some cases, 10, in some cases, 15 years. Um, there are, uh, there's also, as I said, a, um, uh, an assertion that Iran will not reprocess its, um, its, um, its spent fuel and that it will return the spent fuel from its reactors to, in, in the one case they have a the Bushir reactor, the fuel will go back to Russia. Um, I guess I would like to have seen that return of fuel to be a requirement and not, I mean, it, it, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, that there is an intention but not a requirement that that continue throughout, um, you know, the rest of. In perpetuity of, yeah. of Bushir. Yeah. Uh, well. And, and for other reactors. So for Boucher, uh, if, if, in order for Iran to essentially uh, not send back the fuel, it would have to have the capability to produce its own fuel. 
which it says it would like to do, but right. the prospects of uh, producing fuel certified for a PWR are daunting. Right. Uh, and it, Russia has made perfectly clear that they have no interest in helping Iran do this, and that if Iran did this, it would violate all sorts of uh, liability agreements and so forth. And I suspect Iran will not attempt to do mm -hmm. this. Now, mm -hmm. as far as its domestic reactors, that's a different problem. Right. The key there is to make sure those reactors remain small so that the rate of plutonium production in those reactors is, is slow and hopefully high burn up so that the quality of that plutonium is also poor. Um, so in terms of the reprocessing element. Right. Uh, uh, there are a few other areas of the deal that I feel are, are weak, if, if you would like my perspective. <laughs> um, you know, in the, uh, one thing is that in, in the calculation of the breakout capability um, is a very, uh, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, a very specific set of assumptions. And there are dozens of assumptions that go into these calculations. Uh, but one of the, uh, the most dubious assumption is that fuel that is enriched but fabricated into fuel is inaccessible for a breakout program, that they won't take spent fabricated fuel, in particular fuel that has been fabricated for the Tehran Research Reactor at 19.75% U-235, will not be uh, dissolved and refluorinated and turned back into UF-6. Um, you know, by my calculations, if you assume that Iran is willing to, to, to use its fresh fuel, uh, you can push the breakout timeline down to seven weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. But by the same token, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, by, if you do the same calculation right now, they are, you know, one week. <laughs> a few days <laughs> away right. uh, from a bomb. So uh, it's still an improvement. Now, I, uh, we will see, you know, uh, what happens. One of the good things about fabricated fuel is that fuel is very easily safeguarded. Uh, it will be on different, different in, at different facilities. Uh, you know, it will be a very instant trigger uh, if that fuel is removed in, and dissolved. Another, the, the deal attempted to deal with this by claiming that uh, fuels would contain burnable poisons. And for those of you who are not nuclear engineers, burnable poisons are essentially other elements, or more specifically isotopes, but elements that are added to the fuel that absorb neutrons uh, in order to control the reactivity of the reactor. So in the beginning, the fuel is very reactive and you need to dampen it, so you add this, quote, poison that dampens things down and then they sort of burn out over the life of the fuel and it stabilizes the reactor. So the claim is that the co these burnable poisons uh, will contaminate the fuel and they won't be able to pr do this recovery process that I just described. Mm. Uh, and that's all it, all it says. Um, but if you're a chemist and you look at the burnable poisons, which are sort of in order uh, from most common to least common, gadolinium, uh, europium, samarium, uh, diazeopramium, hafnium, lutetium, uh, the, none of these form a plus six oxidation state, which means that as you uh, are going to uh, fluorinate this fuel, the uranium will form a nice symmetric uranium hexafluoride molecule and it will turn into a gas. But these other poisons form uh, non-symmetric uh, molecules that have stronger van der Waals interactions and therefore do not turn into a gas. And those will stay in the bottom of your container as you warm it up. <laughs> and so you can purify the fuel just through a, essentially a distillation process. And so when I put this to the technical negotiators, I got a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I think some of the... Uh, the barriers uh, weren't thought through as well as they, they might have been. Uh, but all that said, it is still a far more stable situation than we had without a deal. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. This is for Dan. I want to delve into the details. So over the last summer break, I went and had a nice big dinner with my family and friends, and they started since I'm a nuclear engineer. They wanted to ask me about the Iran deal. I was prepared to talk about gun type versus explosion type, plutonium, uranium, all these details. They didn't care about those details. They cared about inspections. I have no idea what's going on with the Iran deal. They even claim things like 
oh, Iran gets to inspect itself. Like, I seriously doubt that. And they're like, well, watch the news. So, yeah, what's up with the inspections? Does, any, does anyone want to address that? Um, so, that's with respect to Parshan, right? That he's well, the, that particular about. one is Parshan, yes. Yeah. Inspecting I, yourself. So, I don't know about that. I mean, I don't... <laughs> I mean, the thing so, that I, go ahead. Okay, so a press release was issued today by the IAEA on this. Um, so this is a story that goes back to George Jan, who's an AP reporter based in Vienna, who was leaked a document, which was a draft that, that the IAEA did not agree to. And he was leaked, just the fact that he was leaked that document indicates that the final agreement must be better. Uh, you know, and the fact that, uh, you know, it's, it's a very sketchy situation. But the bottom line is this. Iran uh, takes the samples under redundant video surveillance. And this allows both governments to spin right. the sampling process as they wish. You know, the IAEA gets to say, we supervise the sampling process. And the Iranians get to say, no inspectors were present, <laughs> you know. And so both sides say what they will, and then what happens is you have conservative media in the US picking up on Iranian press releases, which are only telling half of the story, and saying, ah, oh, you know, see, we told you the IAEA is a sellout. Right. Um, so that's, that's what's going on with the inspector itself. Uh, there are other, we can get into other ones, there are other sort of debates going on. But for the most part, I think the bottom line is this. IAEA inspections are great, but the US never trusted the IAEA to guarantee that Iran was not going nuclear. It never depended on the IAEA to detect a nation nuclear weapons program when it did exist in Iran. It depends on the intelligence community. And it will always depend on the intelligence community and will always assume the worst about Iran and those have factored into its calculations. So this is sort of theater. Should add that that particular facility is not a facility where nuclear fuel or, or weapons grade fuels being made. Any fuel. No fuels being made. Right. right. It's, it's a facility which is used for related military activity like building triggers, is that right? So the, ac the accusation is there is a test chamber there to test the timing on the implosion mechanism for a weapon. And when the IEA went there yesterday, they said they saw no chamber. So, so. I saw a question. Yeah. Um, is there any knowledge of how far any Iranian nuclear program might have come in weapons design? Is it something where they were simply material limited or whether there were still significant technical challenges they were uh, trying to overcome? I have no idea. Uh, I'm, I don't have any access to any classified information, so I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if no. <laughs> Scott can say anything. <laughs> I can only say uh, what is in the public domain. So I guess there are two things to note here. Uh, the fissile material of concern here is highly enriched uranium. And you can make a nuclear weapon with highly enriched uranium by taking two chunks in your hand and slapping it together. So, you know, Iran is not technically limited in making a nuclear weapon. Uh, the nice, sophisticated, lightweight, compact nuclear weapons uh, have historically been challenging, although more because of their plutonium content than their design there are elements of the design which are challenging still. Uh, there is a publication in Jane's Intelligence Weekly that reveals information that I cannot explain without violating clearance rules, but suggests that Iran was there, mm -hmm. that Iran had a sophisticated level of understanding at one point. So I don't see that as a barrier. Cody and... I don't think they have it yet, do they? Uh, it's, it's, it's not it's, been formally declared, but Russia has said they will take the LEU. Okay. Uh, picking up on John, I'm Cole Harrison, Massapiece, actually. Picking up on John Chairman's remark about Hillary's speech, uh, we noticed that most of the Democrats who supported the Iran deal did so by saying that it was the best way to stick it to Iran, uh, but that Iran was the 
most dangerous, you know, was a very serious national mm -hmm. security threat to the United States. Uh, the possibility that Iran would get a bomb was a very grave risk, and this, this, this deal would make sure that Iran would get a bomb. Um, is this true? Is Iran the most serious national security threat to the United States? Tom Friedman says that Saudi Arabia is a far worse actor than Iran, and he's close to the national security establishment, isn't he, or at least some national security. Threat. Well, it depends on how you define a national security threat, obviously. <laughs> Well, I think I think it's fairly. I had a I had a student a couple of years ago, a few years ago, do a um, compile data on on attitudes, opinion surveys of Americans over a long period of time, going back to the, to the uh, Iranian Revolution, and and it's shown a remarkably consistent level of hostility toward Iran, majoritarian hostility, and still does, um, even though uh, higher percentages, sometimes a majority, support the Iran deal, the nuclear deal. But um, I think it derives from uh, this, this animus toward Iran, derives from real world events to some extent. Um, uh, terrorism and whatnot, but but more importantly, it goes back to the hostage taking of the, the embassy, um, and the United States has never really gotten over that trauma, and um, it's just stuck in the craw, and and it and then it plays out in various ways over time, depending on on world events, and of course the Iranians have done their part to. Uh, unintentionally, I guess, feed that um, paranoia. The, the two countries have their own national narrative about the other country, and they're very incompatible. And I won't, you know, go into the details, but you can imagine, you know, the stories are very different. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I think would be very useful for NGOs and others who are involved in sort of track two diplomacy is to try to reach a common narrative of what the relationship is factually and what it what it could be because these kinds of things just keep coming back and in Iran it's you know in US imperialism and interference and corruption of Iran and in here it's about threats and you know it's a kind of form of orientalism and so on so um, I think it goes back to that, but the, the real national security threat, Iran is not a real national security threat to the United States. I think Barry Posen once said that the New York Police Department is more capable than the Iranian army. And, um, you know, it has a very small expenditure on military. And without nuclear weapons, in fact, there, there's really not anything that could ever uh, threat the United States with. And with that, uh, we've reached the end of our uh, regular time. We'll have uh, the room for another half hour, so please feel free to come up and uh, ask questions individually. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you.